Good morning. Thank you for uh, joining us uh, wherever you are in the world. Maybe good afternoon, good evening for some of you. Um, I'm very pleased to be here to uh, host our first panel, Lighting the Road to the Future of Work. The Future of Work is a topic that uh, I was interested in well before the pandemic, uh, but seems to have become almost all consuming for some of the uh, people that I talk to uh, in the worlds of uh, leadership, leadership development, human resources and, and beyond. So I'm delighted that we've got an excellent panel who I'll introduce in a second. First of all, though, I want to make clear that this is a very interactive session. I'm hoping that you are going to, as Bevan has suggested, submit questions and uh, ideas into the uh, Slido app uh, and enable us as a panel to weave those into our discussion. Please don't wait right till the end. Uh, you can start to uh, post ideas and questions uh, as, as soon as you like. Uh, just to warm everybody up, uh, I want to start with a poll, um, which uh, I hope will just kind of set the tone a little bit, uh, unfreeze you, allow you to kind of get into the swing of the discussion. Um, here it is. You have, so imagine you have, you probably all do have a limited budget. Select two of the following priorities for training over the next five years business and technical skills, leadership skills, interpersonal skills, that's things like communication and negotiation, or intrapersonal skills, so things like self-management, resilience, in which we're all getting a, a very uh, serious lesson through the pandemic and lockdowns right now. So if you could use the Slido app to select two of those priorities over the next five years while I introduce a panel and we'll come back to it just before we start the main discussion. Um, one of the things that I've written about recently is the question of sort of skills gaps and how they're changing. Uh, and uh, I drew on the recent Future of Jobs survey that the World Economic Forum produced, uh, which included a list of the five uh, or more skills needed for 2025 based on their surveys. And they were uh, in this order, analytical thinking and innovation, active learning and learning strategies, complex problem solving, critical thinking and analysis, creativity, originality and initiative. And the question, those are not necessarily surprising as skills that might be needed over the next five years. But my question was, uh, how are these going to be taught? They're the main things that can be done on the job. If people have fewer jobs or jobs that don't adhere to one employer, uh, how do we go about teaching those skills and bringing them through into the particularly the younger generation of the workforce? One thing we might touch on in our discussion. So just taking a look at the outcome of the poll there, it's the self-management and resilience that seems to be topping the list with a, a close to a draw between leadership skills and interpersonal and the business and technical lower down. So to some degree endorsing a little bit the uh, uh, the suggestions there from the World Economic Forum poll as well, uh, that it was these um, in analytical thinking uh, type of skills that were going to be um, active learning skills that were going to be the ones that would be most necessary uh, up to 2025. So let me introduce our expert panel awaiting patiently. Uh, we've got Sergei Gorbatov, uh, professor at IE Business School, we have the Head of Leadership Development and Talent, Man Talent Management at SAVIC, Sofian Lamali, and the co-founder and director of the Institute for the Future of Work, Anna Thomas, joining us. And I'm going to start with Sofian and ask this question in some form to all three of the panelists, but starting with Sofian. Uh, and the question really is uh, the same one that we've been discussing up till now. What skills do you think are going to be needed for the next five years, Sofian? Well, first of all, th thank you for having me. I'm uh, very pleased to be here with uh, such a, a great panel. Um, well, that's that's the million dollar question, I guess. Um, and the reality is, is we don't know. Uh, w we cannot predict the future. All we can do is to look at trends and, and, and anticipate that these trends are going to continue. Um, in, in the world we are facing, which is, you know, you heard about the, the topic of VUCA, uh, things become unpredictable. And in a world where you don't have the solutions because either the world is too complex um, or, or it requires a lot of collaboration, 
there is one single thing that to me becomes the, if you will, the meta skill of everything, which is curiosity. Uh, we are facing new types of problems that we never seen. And uh, it's not about knowing the answer before the problem happens, but it's about your ability to learn throughout the process. And we've seen that with the, with the COVID. So, and, and curiosity is something that I will be, uh, you know, uh, that will fit into the intrapersonal skills, like the ability to really lead self, but also uh, uh, going towards others, whether it's people or new concepts or new solutions. So for me, curiosity is one of the of the topics of the of the skills of the future, and I, and I'll reflect on another one, which is that notion of purpose. Uh, I, I think the shift, the the global paradigm of uh, capitalism as it it is and it used to be, um, is shifting somehow, uh, slowly, but still shifting to a, a, a more social capitalism, more uh, uh, stakeholder-based capitalism. And um, in, in that kind of environment, the ability for organizations and for leaders to really drive purpose, uh, which starts with explaining the why of doing things, um, is going to be key for the future, for the new generations coming to the workplace. So I, I'll pause here. Uh, and uh, I guess we, it's, it's a long talk, but I'll, I'll open the floor for my colleagues as well. Thanks, Sophie. And just one sort of follow-up question. You mentioned curiosity. I mean, isn't curiosity an innate trait? You're either a curious person, I'm a curious person, which is why I want, like being a journalist, uh, and, or you're not. Uh, is that something that can be taught? So um, I, I believe so. And uh, the research, the academic research on this field is showing that we are all differently curious. Uh, that's the first thing. Uh, you have a kind of um, very, uh, very uh, specific curiosity, which is like if you're investigating, you're looking for something and you're very focused on how you're going to find a solution. And there's a kind of uh, extrinsic curiosity where you kind of uh, somehow derail from your own focus but and go and explore. And people are slightly different in how curious they are. The second thing is um, I think we are all born curious. You know, if you think about the children, you know, when if you have three or four year old children, uh, they come to you most likely asking you a lot of questions about why we do this, why we do that. And, and this tends to stay not, not more than a couple of months. And then they start to ask less questions. And my um, hypothesis is that the society, the parents, the school, the workplace, the, the, the culture, the society is is actually somehow removing the curiosity. So it's it's like we are teaching ourselves to be less curious. And, and I think as organization, we need to actually uh, create the space for curiosity and actually reward curiosity. Because if you think about all the progress of the humanity, uh, it was somehow driven by curiosity. Right, thank you. We'll revisit that, I'm sure. I'm still curious about how we teach curiosity. Perhaps there'll be some questions from the audience about that. Um, let me turn to Anna from the Institute for the Future of Work. Anna, what are you finding? What do you think are the sort of skills that are necessary over the next five years, building on what Sophian's already illuminated? Um, thank you, um, Andrew. Well, um, COVID has hit us in the middle of this sort of massive technological uh, revolution, which, as the WEF report has described, uh, the one that you refer to, Andrew, as a double disruption. In the UK, it could be a triple disruption. And so I think it's, a, it's, it's helpful, perhaps, to think about the question and how to answer it in that frame, because we're responding to this shock, of course. Um, it's also perhaps complementing what uh, my co-panelist has said, um, it may be helpful to think about um, answering the question um, through looking at the uh, concept, through looking at concept of skills bias technological change, um, which suggests that technological change is biased towards higher skills, demanding more educated labour and leading markets to reward them for that education. So I think. Um, that gives us a sort of frame for thinking about the question, which, which may be helpful. I mean, broadly speaking, I agree with the WEF report um, that sort of key skills are the ones, um, and this is very pronounced, this has been shown as really pronounced through COVID, are problem solving, critical thinking, analysis, plus the new batch of skills, sort of self-management 
uh, skills and active learning, resilience, stress tolerance, and so on. Um, but I think what we really want is to be able to combine these skills um, in new ways. So to take that sort of argument, if you like, a step further. Um, and it's similar for tech skills. You don't just want tech design skills, you want uh, design and critical thinking together. Um, so um, I think perhaps, perhaps one point to finish that it's helpful to think big about how to use these skills. Um, and going back to your point about curiosity, sort of perhaps the question to ask is how would we bring out, how would we understand curiosity and respond to it in our most junior uh, members of our, of our of our workforce? You know, how can we understand their skills differently, um, uh, you know, match their skills differently and experiment differently um, with ways to, um, uh, to assist their, their learning pathways? Yes, that's a good point. I mean, we don't necessarily want all our um, all our employees to be at play, to Sophian's point, like uh, like children. Sometimes we're going to say, you know, you'd actually do need to hit the second quarter uh, results. And for that, you might need the technical skills. I wonder, Anna, just to follow up on that, whether you think that companies, many of whom are listening to us today, uh, are this bias that you mentioned towards the technical skills potentially, is that not just not good business sense? I mean, you're looking at what you're investing. We saw how, how this audience would try and deploy their resources. And you may be thinking to yourself, some of this is going to be a necessary business skill. If I don't have people who have that skill, uh, I'm going to have to teach them. They can be as curious as they like, but if they can't work the machinery or operate the new technology or understand the balance sheet, I'm lost. Um, well, there are there are there are always going to be sort of divergences, and we've seen divergences and different forms of polarisation uh, through COVID, um, without a doubt. I think you know the real problem will be to figure out to use these key skills um, in in how to manage disruption uh, for the workforce, you know, spreading opportunity, reducing risk, and so on, and think thinking creatively and experimenting with new ways to make sure that human skills complement tech skills and technology. Right. Uh, Sergey, let me come to you. I mean, you, you've done a lot of work in this area and research. Tell me what you're taking from this and what you see as the skills. I know that when we were talking before the uh, before the panel in preparing the panel, um, you pointed out some of the some of the WEF findings. Not not particularly surprising. They don't differ necessarily pre or post COVID. But tell me what you're making of the of the next five years. Uh, thanks, um, uh, thanks, Andrew. First of all. There are no new skills um, appearing, right? We, uh, particularly when it comes to leadership and management skills. Um, they existed long before. What's changing is the importance of those skills to lead people and organizations through these new times. That's why it's important to really understand what is changing or what has changed. And um, if we approach it like that, it will become much clearer for each specific company which skill they need to focus on. Because for each individual, for each team, uh, for each organization, that answer could be different. And you would start with your strategy. Uh, has your strategy changed uh, in response to the changing environment? Yes or no? If the answer is yes, well, then probably you would need more technical skills, right? So to this, um, uh, to Anna's point, yes, uh, then you would need to train people because probably you will be venturing into new markets or new, uh, new segments. And to reach them, you would need to train people very quickly on the skills that are necessary for that. If the answer is no, well, then you know what? Uh, most likely the skills that already exist in the organization are just fine. You need to focus somewhere else. Where do you want to focus? Well, let's see what else has changed. The importance of context. Previously, we were operating in a more stable environment. Right now, the context has, sh uh, has shifted. Therefore, um, skills like creating meaning or providing safety have become more salient. For example, safety signaling. Yeah, it's uh, a competence that we didn't talk about previously. Why? Because most people felt safe in, in, in their jobs, uh, in, their, in, in their communities, in their families. In the times of COVID, leaders who were most effective could really transmit the sense of safety that would then percolate in the organization. The CEO of AbbVie, Rick Gonzalez, addressed all the employees in a video message saying, no job will be lost due to COVID. As simple 
saying, you know, there are so many things that you need to worry about, your loved ones, uh, your health, whatnot, whatnot. Your paycheck is something that you don't need to worry about. Uh, and things like that or creating meaning, making sense of everything and connecting the dots so that there is a picture. What else is changing? How the work gets done. You can't really control and command in uh, situations where you don't see the work because it's knowledge work most of the time for, for many of us and you don't see the worker. COVID has removed everyone from the streets and from the offices. So how do you manage performance of someone that you don't see? Therefore, remote performance management, setting goals, giving feedback. So uh, we, uh, I, I teach a lot and I speak a lot on the topic of feedback. The amount of requests has spiked. Now everyone wants to teach feedback. Why? Uh, previously, okay, everyone uh, was uh, sitting next to their boss, to their uh, supervisor. They could control, they could monitor, they could uh, really manage uh the, the the work directly when you can't manage the work directly how do you do that indirectly so leaders don't have any other option but to develop their people uh so that the people can step up in their performance and that goes back to peter drucker's saying 20 years ago that the biggest challenge of organizations of this century is to uh, manage the productivity of knowledge work what else has changed how we relate to each other in addition to COVID. There are social movements, social pressure, pressure on the organizations to address purpose, like Seth and Seth. Uh, we see, uh, but particularly in the United States, uh, but also in other parts of the world, everything that's related to social movements, social pressure on race, justice, uh, gender. How do we create communities? How do we unite our employees on those agenda? Because right now there is a, a, a drift uh, that touches organizations uh, as well. Uh, so this uh, community management skills, um, interpersonal uh, sensing, and of course, there are skills that never go away. Decision making. Every leadership program would have as, um, a session on decision making, because that's the ultimate measure of success. Do you make good decisions? Um, thinking in paradox became more important because we live in a paradox. Uh, being physically distant, we became more united. Figure that out. And leaders who were able to reconcile those differences that don't go away, they were most effective in the times of crisis. So I can talk about it for, for, for a long time, and but I, I want to be conscious of the time. Thanks, we'll come back to a lot of those very stimulating thoughts, but I just wanted to throw one of them at Sophia and actually to pick up the discussion a little bit. Um, obviously, you know, Sabic, a large company, you've had the same strains that lots of large companies have had during the crisis with remote working, suddenly people forced into remote working, perhaps who weren't thinking about it. But in this specific area of development and training and skills, what, what has been, what have you done differently uh, in order to keep people uh, engaged with some of the areas uh, that both uh, Anna and Sergei have talked about. What, what have you had to change in the way in which you're transmitting these skills? Yeah, I, I guess that the change that um, uh, we went through uh, is has different types of, of natures. The, the first is a technology change. And for me, the technology is not necessarily the most important thing, but it's there. And, and um, moving from a face-to-face -to -face typical format to a, a digital, has become a, a must for all uh, because we didn't have the choice. And it's funny because we're trying to push digital learning for a couple of years and it's almost like the, the COVID paved the way for us. So um, from a format point of view, shifting to digital uh, pretty quickly what was key for us. And, and by shifting to digital, we also change the format because you cannot keep people for eight hours uh, on, on the digital format. It, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, the second piece uh, where I saw a shift in, in, in our leadership development interventions is the content of it. Uh, we used to talk a lot with, about, you know, leading people, influencing people, uh, you know, leading strategically, innovation, thinking outside the box, etc. And um, we looked at, well, are these topics still relevant and what else needs to be relevant? And uh, instead of guessing from our side, we reached out to our leaders. So we reached out to our top 150 leaders and say, what, what is it that you need exactly at the moment? And um, 
very surprisingly, uh, it, it was almost unanimously, 90% of them really cared about, you know, managing my own emotions, resilience, how I keep the morale of the team, how I, I, you know, how I keep everybody engaged. So it was very much about emotional skills. And, uh, and that yeah. was a, a great, a great uh, learning from our side. Um, yeah, and, and probably the last shift I will, I will say is, is similar to digital, um, less of an event-based kind of development, but more, uh, uh, more moving more into a kind of learning in the flow of work. And um, uh, we are not full into that. I think there's a journey to get there, especially from a leadership point of view. Um, but the ability to have very digest bites for leaders whenever they need it, based on what's going on in the company, uh, has become more and more uh, relevant, uh, if not central to what we are doing. Right. Uh, turning to Anna, I mean, obviously, we're in the middle of this. We hope we're coming towards the end of this particular crisis. And it's hard to predict exactly what we'd be, we maybe have to have this panel again in a year's time to see if anything changed. But I mean, your institute looks at the long view. and We're thinking about five years ahead here. And what is your sense of whether this has uh, the crisis has genuinely changed what needs to be done and how it can be done? Uh, in terms of leadership development and, and training for the future of work? Or has it just accelerated and brought to the fore some of those ideas and um, preoccupations that Sofian mentioned, leaders worrying about personal resilience and so on? Has it just sort of raised those in the, in the priorities? Um, I think um, there's been a lot, of course, of managerial distraction in dealing with crises um, and also putting up and changing process processes um, to respond to the new demands and the new tar targets. Whilst there's been sort of a fall in demand, a greater financial restraints and, you know, the pure uncertainty effect. Um, um, I would ask, I'd ask the audience about whether or how, how and to what extent it has changed approach to skilling for the wider audience and the wider workforce. Um, a research fellow of ours at the LSE has done, um, has, has, done, has done a piece of work which suggests that actually when there is a shock, um, companies counterintuitively often cut training uh, costs. Mm -hmm. um, um, and so I would be I would be hugely interested if we could ask perhaps on Slido um, whether or not training budgets have increased um, or decreased. Um, I suppose circling back to your question, um, because we look at everything through the lens of technology, it's worth thinking about perhaps the positive effects um, that there have been um, in terms of thinking about uh, use of technology and responding to that. And um, so not just response to specific needs and immediate challenges, such as reducing face-to-face -face contact, rather obviously, um, and as Sergey said, thinking about how you can make remote working, you know, re really work um, and manage risks and opportunities for that. Um, but also thinking about how shock can force firms to sort of innovate and think about new ways of working. Um, and we think that has happened in our own survey um, and a recent survey by the LSC have also demonstrated that, um, not just that management processes have changed, but that they are that people are identifying COVID as the trigger point and that they are likely to stick. Um, and thinking about things like the pit stop theory, that you can do things that cost uh, time but save money. Um, perhaps more, you're more likely to do that when you're working remotely, um, or that you may innovate, um, although the results of that are, are, un, un, are, you know, are, are not entirely clear, you may see new opportunities. Right. So, Kate, okay, uh, back to you. I mean, the, the remote work issue that, that a lot of us have written about has been the loss of that sort of serendipitous um, instant meeting that you might have with people. And that plays into leadership development, doesn't it? Because to a large degree, if you're a junior or, or new member of the team, you are picking up signals when you're working directly with somebody. And obviously, large companies have long had distributed workforces, but generally they have been pods of people working together where the younger ones or the newer ones can learn from the ones who are more experienced. Well, how, how do we replicate that in a world where we perhaps are in a more hybrid and more distributed um, workforce? Intentionally. Intention is the key word here. Previously, we would often expect that people would learn that by osmosis. 
Well, that is no longer the case because people don't interact with each other and we are great social connectors. We tend to mirror the behaviors. We tend to mirror even the values of people. Uh, once we get to a group of people, we are, we're professional boss watchers. Uh, we look uh, upwards and uh, we say, okay, uh, that make her or him successful. I will do, I will do the same. Now, if we are working in a dis distributed way, how do you learn that? You need to be intentional about your one-on-ones. You need to be intentional about your uh, team meetings. You need to be intentional of recreating those opportunities for serendipitous connection. Uh, if we look at examples, Buffer, uh, and that's a, a social media platform, they intentionally connect people from different parts of the organization to meet with each other at random and have those conversations with no agenda that you would typically have around the water cooler. And they were doing that before the pandemic. So when the pandemic happened, they say, okay, we just continue doing what, what, what we're doing because that worked. For more traditional company, that was more difficult because that, that was a change. I remember that in, in March and April, I was uh, asked to deliver those courses and trainings on, okay, how do we lead virtual teams? So I thought, um, well, you just continue doing what a good manager does. You need to create relationship. You need to make, uh, to help your people succeed and you need to create meaning. So, um, are you praising your people? Are you uh, encouraging them? Are you connecting with them on a personal level? Are you checking in with them? How are they doing? How are their families? So that's about relationship. Uh, are you helping them succeed? Are you setting, uh, good goals? Are you giving feedback on the progress of the goals? Um, Teresa Mabile's research from, from Harvard will tell us that uh, one of the biggest motivators for people is getting feedback on the progress. Yeah? Her book, The Progress Principle. Uh, are you uh, giving feedback and appraising them? Because sometimes all people are demotivated. Well, um, sometimes training is not the solution. Yeah? Sometimes it's good manager's work. And are you right. communicating, are you creating meaning? Are you uh, making sense of this ambiguity? So don't do anything differently. Just do what a good manager would do using the new channels, the new forms, and you need to be intentional about that. And if some managers were naturally skilled at that and were doing that uh, without much thinking, well, now you just need to plan for it. Right. I mean, there's a, a question come out through Slido. I'm going to start bringing in some of these questions now so that we can work through a few, but perhaps I'll put this one to Sophie. And it leads on from what uh, uh, Sergey was saying, but uh, the, this question about how can we influence our managers to engage with skills training when they're stretched and exhausted and dealing with high workloads. And I mean, I would add to that, I mean, I made my uh, data maybe out of date, but I mean, it was always my impression that online training was not as effective as in-person training. Uh, and as a former colleague of mine once said, uh, you know, online training is the thing that lands in your inbox. And it says, when you start it, this will, this is a 20 minute module and everybody goes, right, I can do that in 10 minutes. So there's a sort of um, sense that the, the remoteness would distract from the training, but for managers themselves, how Sophie, and have you managed to get managers to engage with skills training at a time of high personal and professional and commercial stress? Yeah, I mean, first of all, uh, in, in my company, I think the leader were, ha, had shown a very strong appetite for that. So, uh, and, and, and as Anna mentioned, sometimes shock is, is, is the best way, unfortunately, to really, uh, you know, encourage people to learn. And, and for us, it was not a, a, a big challenge. I would also say uh, on, on Sergey's point is the, the digital or the online uh, challenge is not the challenge. For me, the real challenge is that it's a leadership challenge. It's a performance challenge. The online piece is just a constraint to that challenge. Sometimes we tend to think that the online is the problem we need to solve. I don't think so. So as Sergey mentioned, keep doing what you're doing every day, but do it digitally. And the fact is when you do it digitally, you, you translate to a new language. And, and when you translate to a new language, you need to make sure that the translation is working. And um, in that specific case, um, the, the online learning is only as good as the quality of learning 
It's not because of the online, it's because of the learning design that is in it. And, um, and for us, it was, uh, from our side, it was first, it should not be pushed. I mean, learning should not be pushed. Uh, um, uh, as a company, what we're trying to do is to create a space and an environment where first, is it safe to learn? It, it is considered as work, so it's not something you need to um, uh, take a leave for. Second thing, it's more than actually okay to do it, it's encouraged to do it. And, and third thing is to provide the resources. Uh, people should not have to go outside and use their own channels. There should be a lot of knowledge available. And the challenge is there's so much knowledge available out there that we need to find the right way to curate that knowledge. I think this is still a big challenge for most of the organizations um, uh, because nowadays uh, knowledge is no longer scarce. It's, there is uh, too much knowledge available. So how do you make sure that you provide the right knowledge to people without over designing what they need to learn? Because telling people what they need to learn all the time is, no, is not uh, the best option as well uh, uh, for me. So. I mean, making knowledge available, making it safe for people to learn is, is for me, the, the best way to do it. Um, when it feels like it's pushed, uh, uh, you, you would have a question like this. We are exhausted with training. and you ask us to do some mandatory uh, compliance training or uh, this kind of thing can be a, a bit exhausting. Right. I mean, Anna, we, we, uh, perhaps we're exaggerating the digital aspect of this and, and, and losing sight of the fact that, you know, what we're talking about is dealing with people, many of whom dealt with, uh, we were dealt with through email and through video links and through remote conference calls before the pandemic and will do afterwards. So it is perhaps we need to put the technology to one side and, and go to the core things that we want to actually make people learn. What do you think about that? Um. I think that's right, except that we can't entirely put the technology to one side when we're, when we're, when we're having this call remotely and when we're dealing with, you know, both our own learning and the learning of others uh, remotely too. Um, perhaps um, adding to what um, you've just said, um, we've, we found that responses are very, very different for different demographic groups and for different, um, not just for actually de demographic groups um, or, or backgrounds of people um, and resources, but also for just for people and personality types in how they respond um, to these things remotely. And so really thinking about that and the need to sort of personalise it. Um, and yeah. respond to different needs, I think is, is really super important right now. Um, and the other thing perhaps though, which loops back to your question, Andrew, is how we can recognize the limits of what we can do remotely. It's right we can, we can maximize we can maximize what we can do as Sergey has spoken to you quite you know quite rightly and and we've also our interviews have found unexpected benefits um in that by being forced to to share learning uh, remotely you're sometimes required to articulate or record tacit knowledge for example that you've never had to do before um uh, but equally um the, the I, I think what we've all been writing and talking about for a while um that relationship and team building skills that pastoral needs the tactile visual uh, work um, and, and, and tasks involving sort of teaching and coaching are undoubtedly much harder. Yes, that tacit knowledge point is interesting. You and I've been talking offline about a uh, column I'm writing about not working from home and the ways in which that uh, the, a group of people, the majority actually would, would be affected. But I know that you, some of your work has, has come up with the ways in which I think healthcare workers had to record tacit knowledge that they might otherwise just have passed on by example, right? Yeah, yes, yes. I mean, it was really interesting how he accessed that point. You wouldn't have thought necessarily that it was a specialist nurse, um, but it was a specialist nurse who articulated this point best, um, which is saying, describing to us, you know, a lot of what we do is intuitive and we had to make explicit um, what had become implicit over years of practice. Um, yes, yes. I think that's a new point. So, okay, coming back to you with, with, to pick up some of the questions that are coming in, I'd, I'd really like to get some answers to Anna's question about whether people have cut, maintained or increased their training budget. I'm not quite sure how we do that through Slido. It's almost a, a, another poll, but whether that can be done. Uh, but I saw a question lurking below the line here on Slido uh, about the um, but this line between the need for curiosity experimentation and the need to get along and get the work done um, and this goes beyond covid related or, or lockdown related questions it's a it's kind of this burning question of giving people the time to be curious and experiment versus 
getting on with the work. I mean, Sergey, what's the latest on this that you can tell our audience about how they strike the balance? But we know about Google and 3M and others with their 15% time and so on. But you know, where's the latest thinking on this? I would go back to my fundamental question. What's your strategy? What do you want to do? What skills do you need? And uh, by the way, on December 10th, uh, we'll be conducting a masterclass here uh, at, uh, at Headspring. Uh, so please join where we'll talk about, okay, what skills are changing? Uh, and how do you lead your organization on this transformation journey uh, through the four step process? You know, you diagnose the situation, you align business leaders around the skill needs, uh, then you need to figure out the solution, and then you need to create leadership accountability for, uh, for training. So December 10th, uh, join us for that discussion. And then you might uh, think, okay, curiosity, how is that related to my strategy? Do uh, to uh, get to where we want to be, do we need more curious people or do we need less curious people? Uh, because what's the dark side of curiosity? Lots of ideation, lots of bright ideas. Can you lend them? Uh, are those ideas relevant to what we're trying to achieve? Yeah, very, uh, some, sometimes I have to coach leaders, uh, particularly with high curiosity, low conscientiousness or prudence. Uh, so lots of creative ideas, uh, but lacking uh, the ability to implement them. You need right. to have a good balance and you need to have uh, the, the, the right people in the right place. Do you, do you want a highly curious accountant? I don't know, maybe if creative accounting is your thing, yeah, absolutely uh, go for it. Uh, the researcher to watch on that, uh, two researchers, Adam Grant, of course, uh, specifically on curiosity, uh, Francesca Gino. Um, uh, so her books, Rebel Talent, a couple of years ago, her uh, article in Howard Business Review, The Business Case for Curiosity. So is it a good thing? Is it nice to have more curiosity than less? Uh, yes. Uh, in, in today's world where uh, you need to, uh, we're, when we're priced uh, for creative solutions, original ideas uh, uh, carry a premium. Yes. Uh, what can you do that? Well, you need to teach people basic skills. Ask uh, what if and why not? Uh, ask what uh, could we do instead of what should we do. So, so there are some tips and tricks on how you do that, but it goes beyond that. You need to create a culture. So experimentation needs to be encouraged. And Andrew mentioned 3M, Estee Lauder, uh, very, very, very good at that. Um, so how can you encourage uh, people to take risks? You, you need to reframe what risk is. And uh, uh, you, you also, you don't want to be known as a frequent flyer, on, uh, you know, um, risk-taking um, uh, airplane, uh, attitude to failure. Uh, do we tolerate failure or do we um, punish someone for, for failing? I mean, it's, 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 it's much more complex than right. that. It's very easy to jump on the curiosity bandwagon, but then you also need to ask the question, what's the culture in my company? And uh, right. am I doing my employees a disservice? by encouraging curiosity, but not changing anything in terms of leadership and ethos of the company to make that curiosity thrive. Right. One, one audience member is just asking, Sergey, quickly uh, what the book was that you mentioned in the, your earlier intervention with progress and feedback, about progress and feedback. The Progress Principle by Teresa Amabile. Yes. Yeah. I, I, I highly recommend that as well. Um, I just wanted to finish, I suppose, by asking each of you about the role of the HR and L&D professional. I did a feature last week in the FT about the pressures on, on the human resources function. Uh, and um, I knew this would happen, but it kind of unleashed a wave of vitriol in the comments from readers uh, about what they think of HR and how low an opinion they have of it. Um, and Sophia, unfairly, probably picking on you as the, as the L&D uh, representative on the panel. I just wondered whether you have some advice for your peers, as it were, about how to handle this opening up of the road to the future of work. Because again, to the point about line managers being under high stress and so on, it might not be the most popular moment to be coming in and, and offering these kinds of longer range visions. What's your, what sort of one sentence yeah. of advice from each of you, but starting with Sophia for the L&D and HR world? Yeah, very quickly, as you rightly mentioned, l and doesn't have the, the best uh, net promoter score in organizations. Um, and perhaps it has to do with the fact that 
the relevance is not always the most important thing for many L&D. Uh, they are very in love with their technologies, their way of doing things, their creative way. And sometimes they forget to really build relationship with the business that they are supporting. So uh, it should start with what are we trying to achieve before we come up to the solution. Sometimes we try to, we fall in love with our solution and then we try to find a problem for that solution. I see this so many times in so many organizations. So um, I will say, listen to your customers. Uh, uh, yeah, listen to your customers, be relevant, remain relevant. Sounds like a good, good advice, Anna. What, what, would, what advice would you give to the wider HR and leadership community? Um, well, what, in a sense, we're all aiming for with the future of work is a better future of work, you know, so a human centered uh, future of work where humans and technology are working much better together, um, which serves both, you know, individuals and also businesses and ultimately the economy that's all aligned. Um, so really thinking about that, that's what that should mean that HR professionals are more important than they have ever been before. So this is, you know, this has all been through COVID. So they are, they're, you know, it's in, it's their, 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 their entire sort of their ethos and training is about a sort of human centered approach to things. So if you think about that in terms of technology adoption, you know, if they were brought in HR professionals at the strategic decision about when, what technology you introduced when, and through the whole innovation and lifestyle of technology, boy, that would right. be better. So my, I, so I don't know, my, uh, my advice would be, um, think big, push harder, do more, you know, be, the, right. um, you know, be involved at earlier points in other types of decision making. This is your time. Yeah. We're just out of time, but Sergey, in a word, one, one word or two words of advice. Know the business, listen to the business, but also know the theory of the case and have your point of view, make a, a solid practical strategy and execute the heck out of it. Thanks very much. Thank you to the audience for your questions and thank you very much to my panel. I think uh, Anna's point about building a better future of work is worth bearing in mind and knowing that everyone in the audience and on the panel has a role in helping to shape that. So uh, thank you very much and I'll hand back to Bevan.